Hi everyone, I'm Debbie Roberts from Property Apprentice. Join me today for the Week in Review where I'll talk about current events for the everyday investor and home buyer. So apologies for this week's review coming out a little bit later than normal. Uh, you might be able to tell from the sound of my voice that I'm recovering from COVID, still in isolation, uh, feeling a lot better. Thank you for asking even though you didn't, but that's okay. So yeah, so topics for this week. First topic, one roof on the 4th of July, double your money, New Zealand's surprising house price jumps. Second topic, good returns on the 4th of July, rental supply spikes while demand dwindles. Third topic for today, News Hub 5th of July, number of financial hardship cases and company closures dropped last quarter. Fourth topic, the New Zealand Mortgage Mag on the 7th of July, New triple CFA rules could lead to fictitious budgets. And last but not least, on interest.co.nz on the 7th of July, existing homeowners well placed to keep moving up the property ladder, but market uncertainties may be making them cautious. So we'll start today's week in review with the first topic from One Roof on the 4th of July, double your money, New Zealand's surprising house price jumps. Data analysis from Velocity confirms that house prices double roughly every 10 years, running numbers going back to 1990 to see what the median house price was on the last day of each year. It showed that house prices have been consistently increasing. From 2002 to 2011, house prices each year were almost exactly double what they were 10 years earlier. But from 2012 to 2021, the increase was only 85% from the previous 10 years probably reflecting that house prices were getting more expensive and therefore growth was slower, according to one roof columnist Ashley Church. There were themes emerging from the data, such as house prices increasing persistently despite local and international shocks like the GFC, which caused house prices in Auckland to drop by around 8%. Another observation is that the slowing growth of house prices is reflecting what the average Kiwi can afford to pay. Although historical trends can't guarantee future performance, Church says the implications of these trends shouldn't be ignored. He fears that house prices will continue to increase despite government intervention. The rate of increase will continue to slow as first home buyers will not be able to afford houses and the doubling of house prices will take longer than the anecdotal 10 years to happen. Velocity head evaluation James Wilson believes that although house prices doubling every decade may be the rule of thumb in New Zealand in the last three decades, it may not always predict the future. More specifically, he said that there's no line in the sand that shows property prices double on a particular 10 year date. The growth is not linear. There may be a dip halfway through the 10 year cycle, just as the housing market has peaks and troughs. Wilson added that the changing landscape of New Zealand homes could affect the trend. There's now more diversity in property types, which means that in a modern suburb, each house performs differently than what was 20 years ago. According to Wilson, the fundamentals support values going only in one direction over the long term, but some market sub-market performance in the coming five to 10 years could change this. CoreLogic Chief Housing Economist Calvin Davidson said that varying opinions on house prices doubling depends on where you put the start and end points for observation. For example, if you started in 1991, then yes, it might double. But if you started it in 1993 to 2003, the numbers are quite a bit different. There have been a few 8 to 10 year periods in the last 30 years that show house prices rising 80 to 100% in some main centres. Davidson argues that the more important question to answer is why. One key reason, according to him, is that interest rates have fallen and that households are more likely to have two incomes which boost their ability to pay for housing. He agrees that house prices doubling in the next decade remains uncertain as interest rates are going up. So I think the moral of this, the moral of that first topic, is if you are investing in property or looking at buying a home, capital gain should be the last thing on your mind you know it will increase in value over the long term but capital growth is certainly nothing that you can rely on so um, yeah it's outside of your control so don't make that the basis for your purchasing decision second topic is from good returns on the 4th of july rental supply spikes while demand dwindles 
According to TradeMe's latest rental price index, the number of properties listed for rent increased by 12% to an all-time year-on-year high in May, while the demand for rental properties fell by 8%. The highest rise in listings was in Wellington at 45%, followed by 24% and Auckland 16%. However, listings in Northland, Waikato, Hawke's Bay, Taranaki, Nelson, Tasman, Otago and Southland dropped compared to a year ago and there was no change in Canterbury. With the exception of Canterbury and Southland, all regions experienced a drop in prospective tenants. The largest decline was in Nelson, Tasman by 28%, followed by Northland, 19%, and Taranaki, 15%. Southland was up by 8%, and Canterbury up 21%. Those were the only regions to see demand for rentals climb when compared with May last year. The rental market is mirroring the property for sale market in May, with the supply up 48% year-on-year, year, while buyer demand dropped by 9%. For the first time this year, rent fell by 1%, but compared to the same month last year, May's median weekly rent marks a 7% rise. Waikato was the only spot to see a new all-time high median weekly rent in May, reaching $525. The biggest year-on-year -year rises were in Taranaki, up 16%, Northland and Southland both up by 11%. Trade Me Sales Director Gavin Lloyd believes that a less competitive market could cause rents to tumble as landlords scramble to fill their rentals. Uh, I find that hard to believe. <laughs> I can't see rents tumbling. You know, rents are a little bit like uh, property values. You know, they do tend to increase over the long term, but I'll come back to that. In terms of rent, the Auckland region's median weekly rent was $600 for the second row in the month of May, increasing by 2% year on year. When compared with the region's record high median rent recorded in January, this marked a slight drop of $10 a week. In the Wellington region, the median weekly rent rose 3% year on year to reach $615 in May. When compared with the month prior, however, this is a marked drop of 2% for the region. As shown by Stats New Zealand figures, despite the rise in listings for sale and the decrease in demand, the number of consents issued are still high. Just over 51,000 new consents were issued in the last 12 months to the end of May. The most popular housing for new consents are standalone properties with 24,536 consented in the year to May. Coming in behind are townhouses, also known as terraced housing, with 19,656 consented and apartments with 4,037 consented. Total value of all building work consented in the year to May was $31.4 billion, up 19.5% on the previous 12 months. Westpac senior economist Satish Ranchod said that although the number of new houses being consented has risen quickly in recent years, the rate of building activity has risen gradually. This implies that residential construction will remain strong, but conditions are changing in the construction industry, and the peak in the construction cycle is becoming clearer into focus, which can have an impact on building activity. Population trends are dramatically different today from what they were a few years ago. Through much of the past decade, population growth far outpaced home building and shortages of housing developed in many regions, especially in Auckland. But now below average net migration is projected to remain low as many New Zealanders, especially the young New Zealanders, are starting to think about moving abroad. And uh, even though the borders are reopening, we haven't seen the massive influx of tourists and you know, immigrants moving to New Zealand, as a lot of people thought might happen. Ranchard believes that the combination of slow population growth and a boom in home building means that shortages in recent years are now being eroded. He added that even allowing for a gradual lift in migration over the coming years, consent issuance is now running well ahead of what's needed to keep up with population changes. For developers, the decline in house prices and the lack of materials and labour, including financing, provide economic uncertainty. These factors are squeezing the operating margins of many small firms. 
Ranchod said these factors are a sign that the peak in the construction cycle is approaching, if not already here. And I would suggest the peak in the construction cycle has already passed that point. So we are seeing a lot of developers that have been slowing down for almost 12 months now. And especially the larger developers, they've really been scaling things back. I think it's a natural part of the property cycle is that, you know, we have a building boom and then things start slowing down when, when the housing market goes into a correction. So I'm certainly not expecting us to see an oversupply of properties. I'm not expecting to see rents tumbling or anything like that. Um, what I would expect to see is that we'll have less properties that have been consented that will actually get built uh, because a lot of developers will just sit on those and uh, people who'd planned on developing their properties themselves with all the uncertainty with building materials and things like that they might put that on the back burner so we could see a lot of building consents that actually don't result in a complete new property if you want to learn more about the housing market feel free to meet, join me at one of our free beginner's guide to property investment events we hold them online and also in person in our office in Ellerslie in Auckland check out propertyapprentice.co.nz for upcoming dates and register today third topic for this week in review is from news hub on the 5th of July number of financial hardship cases and company closures dropped last quarter the June credit indicator from Centrix, which shows credit trends in New Zealand, reveals another record low in hardship levels that they haven't seen since December 2019. In the report, there were only 8,750 borrower accounts flagged for financial hardship. Centrix says this is a signal that people aren't experiencing severe financial distress. However, across May, the number of people missing repayments rose for the third month in a row, which runs contrary to the seasonal trend that's typical at this time of the year. The total number of people who are behind on payments increased by 11.7% compared to the same time last year, showing that some consumers are experiencing financial strain. The proportion of home loans with missed payments in May was only 1%, which is still low. Centrix said that this means borrowers are not feeling mortgage stress despite rises in interest rates and higher costs of living. I suspect a main reason for that is that banks have still been, you know, over the last few years, they've, they've certainly been testing affordability at much higher interest rates than what we're currently on offer. However, Centrix warns that as the economy shrinks, more households will feel the pressure and struggle to pay their bills. The report also found that mortgage lending is down by 34% year on year, but it's only down 4% compared to pre-pandemic May 2019. Due to the housing market downturn, mortgage applications are down by 25%. On the other hand, auto loan and personal loan demand both remain stable compared to the same period last year. Personal lending is low with customer inquiries for buy now, pay later and new credit card demand is also dropping by 32% and 22% year on year respectively. In terms of business performance, low liquidation rates and company closures show a level of resilience for the economy. However, company credit defaults are starting to increase, particularly within the building and hospitality sectors. As changes to the economy take place, it's crucial for businesses to manage their credit risk and for Kiwis to manage their personal debt. Certainly, as far as putting things on buy now, pay later and increasing your credit card limits, that those two things there will have a significant impact on your ability to borrow money if you're looking at purchasing a home. So, you know, really button down on your weekly budget and see if you can trim expenses anywhere in that budget to help make sure that you don't work yourself into a higher level of debt. Okay, you should be working towards getting out of debt if possible. Fourth topic for this week's review is the New Zealand Mortgage Mag on the 7th of July. New triple CFA rules could lead to fictitious budgets. A financial advice company in Auckland, Waikato and the Bay of Plenty offered their alternative view of the recent amendments to the triple CFA. The triple CFA had been criticised for smothering the finance sector in paperwork and depriving credit to dependable borrowers. It was reviewed two months after it took effect for its obvious flaws. 
One significant change involves removing regular savings and investments as examples of expenses that were set off against borrowing entitlements. Another involves removing checks on people's expenses. This is where the cups of latte stories come in when there's robust data from elsewhere. These changes came into effect on the 7th of July. For spokespeople for bank and non-bank lenders, the changes were a good start but remained inadequate. A second tranche of reforms is under consideration by the government. However, a group giving budget advice believes that the recent changes are excessive and could make things worse, not better. Shula Newland of Full Balance Financial Coaching fears that they'll open the door to fictitious customer budgets. She thinks people may have forgotten that the legislation had to be upgraded, which was to protect the harm done by consumer short-term lending. In other words, the uh, loan sharks and, and those sort of situations that was the government's intention to protect people from that. Newland added that due to the unintended consequences to mortgage borrowing, the legislation had been watered down. According to her, not requiring a look at would-be borrowers' bank accounts to verify their current spending was risky. Borrowers may be tempted to make up budgets if they don't understand how they spend their money in the first place, and they often can just come up with any basic figures. Should a case go to court, she believes lenders would blame the decision to lend on the information that the borrower provided. One of her worries is that desperate borrowers are more likely to make things up. Newland also questioned the assumption that people would change their spending after getting a loan. She disagrees that people are willing to stop buying cups of latte in order to meet the higher value goal of paying a mortgage. In her experience, she sees clients spending money as per usual after getting a new loan and then they don't understand why they're struggling. They also use up their savings which leads them to continue borrowing and the cycle continues, keeping them in a poverty trap. And so I think this is where it becomes really useful if you're talking to a mortgage advisor, you know, getting your advice from a mortgage advisor as opposed to dealing with the bank directly. Because if you're dealing with a mortgage advisor that, that works with a range of different lenders, uh, they've got your best interests at heart. So they can really work with you to make sure that this is something that is the right decision for you and help you keep in control of your mortgage. That, you know, a good mortgage advisor is there with you for the entire life of your mortgage, not just for setting up that loan. If you want to get in touch with some good mortgage advisors, feel free to get in touch with my team. That's miteam.co.nz. You can email office at miteam.co.nz and they'll put you in touch with some great mortgage advisors. All right, fifth topic for today, interest.co.nz, 7th of July, existing homeowners are well placed to keep moving up the property ladder, but market uncertainties may be making them cautious. According to interest.co.nz's home loan affordability report, rising interest rates and falling house prices are not just affecting home buyers, they're also affecting homeowners who are planning to move up the property ladder. While the report mainly tracks affordability measures for first home buyers, it also tracks the financial status of those who bought a house several years ago and are looking to make the next move. Their findings show that they've built substantial levels of equity in their first home over the last 10 years, giving them a strong financial base to proceed with their next move. However, recent falls in house prices are beginning to erode equity while rising interest rates are pushing up mortgage payments. This is how those numbers stack up. 10 years ago, in June 2012, the REINZ's national lower quartile selling price was 257000 Sounds ridiculously cheap now, doesn't it? By June 2022, that had risen to 628000 which would have given those homeowners an equity gain of $371,000. Interest.co.nz estimates that if they'd purchased that home with a 20% deposit 10 years ago and resold it at the current low quartile price, they'd have $437,226 in equity to put towards their new home after paying off the mortgage and allowing for selling expenses. This would provide a 52% deposit on the home at the June 2022 national median price of $480,000. 
They'd need to fund the rest of the purchase price by taking out a new mortgage of 402774 The mortgage payments on that would be around $504 a week, assuming a 30-year loan term at 5.1% interest on principal and interest. Interest.co.nz estimates that the combined median after-tax pay of couples working full-time at the median rates of pay for those aged 35 to 39 would be around $2,001 a week. This means that their mortgage payments would eat up just over 25% of their take-home pay each week. By that measure, a couple who bought a modest home a decade ago and are earning average wages should be in the position to move up the property ladder into a more desirable home. They also won't be having trouble securing a bank mortgage as they've got a higher level of equity available, which means a low loan to value ratio and affordable level of repayments. Banks are chasing these types of clients. You'll see lots of cashback offers as they compete with other lenders for that market share. Compared to first home buyers, they're more cautious about lending because of the difficulty they're likely to face in coming up with a deposit and a larger portion of their income would go towards mortgage payments, making them a much riskier proposition. The current low level of housing sales each month suggests that it's not just first home buyers and investors who are holding back from making a purchase. It's likely that many second-rung buyers who'd like to move up the property ladder at some stage are also sitting on the sidelines for the time being at least. Although they are well-placed financially, several aspects of the current market are making them nervous. Number one on the list is falling house prices. Since prices peaked in November last year, the REINZ's lower quartile price nationally declined from $670,000 to $628,000. While the net dropped from 920,000 to 143,000, that's a drop of 80,143. That should have worked in second rung buyers' favour because the drop in value of the home they're buying is likely to be greater than the drop in value of the home that they're selling. But people can act irrationally. People are scared of the thought that the home they're thinking of buying could be worth less than the price they paid for after a few months, even though they could be potentially living in that house for at least 10 years. Number two is the fear of overpaying, which is the predominant mood at the, in the market at the moment. And the way to fix that fear is to negotiate hard. You know, if you don't know how to negotiate, you need to learn because it can save you an awful lot of money. Make your money when you buy. Number three is the lack of capital gains. Hand in hand with falling house prices is lower capital gains. Back when prices were rising strongly, people were motivated to keep moving up the property ladder because they could just sit back and watch their equity grow. However, capital gains has all but disappeared for now. I'd like to emphasize that that is for now because we are in a perfectly normal stage of the property cycle. Number four is rising interest rates. Many people seem to believe that mortgage interest rates are high, but it's just not the case. They're just heading back to long-term norms after a sustained period of being unusually low. The average of the two-year fixed rates offered by major banks in June this year was 5.1%. Ten years ago, in June 2012, it was 5.6%. And 15 years ago, in June 2007, it was 9.18%. The long-term average for one-year fixed rates is about 6.5%. However, the rise in mortgage rates is increasing the amount of money second-rung buyers would need to put aside for mortgage payments to make the move into their next home. Over the 12 months from June 2021 to June 2022, that would have increased from 376 bucks a week to 504 based on the example, an increase of $128 a week. While the mortgage payments would still be well within affordable limits for people on average wages, people are uncomfortable with the idea of rising mortgage payments and the effect this could have on their spending, especially during uncertain times like we've got at the moment with high inflation. So although moving up to their next home would still be a viable financial proposition for most people who own a home, provided they've kept their debt levels under control, it's not surprising that many are deciding to wait and see unless their need to move is pressing. So I'd just like to throw a challenge out there. You tell me, how many other areas do you see people, when something goes on sale, how many other areas of the economy do you see people go, 
oh no I'm not going to buy it now that everything's gone on sale I'm going to wait till prices start increasing again like this is the paradox that we're seeing in the housing market at the moment the whole housing market's gone on sale and yet people are waiting to see when prices start increasing again so that they can get that thing that they've got no control over which is capital gain so you know just Make smarter decisions based on your individual financial position and forget about what's happening in the short term. You need to be focusing on your long term goals. And so if you want to learn more about what we do and how we could help you with that, which includes financial advice, then feel free to join me at one of our free training sessions. We run them just about every week. So you can join me online or in the office at Ellerslie in, in Auckland. So register for one of our upcoming sessions at propertyapprentice.co.nz and I'll look forward to seeing you there soon. Cheers. Thanks for listening.